Hey everyone, and welcome to another monthly Q&A stream. I'm starting to call them monthly because it seems like I'm doing them once a month. It's not really that formal, but that's how it's been working out. So if you're already here, thank you for being here live. Thank you for being on time. Um, gonna give it a couple minutes for people to get here, but feel free to say hi in the chat. Let me know if anything looks or sounds funny. I think we're good though. I'm doing a kind of different setup. I think I might have done a live stream with this setup. Usually I'm tilted the other way in the room, but then you kind of like look into my kitchen and see my microwave. So I sort of like this better, even though I have to set up a light for it because the light is there, you know, boring stuff like that. But anyway, here I am for another Q&A. Hi everybody, thank you. It's getting all set up here. Um, how are you all on this fine Tuesday, end of a long holiday weekend here in the States? So I did not, I was going to say I didn't do anything for Memorial Day weekend, which I didn't exactly do anything for the weekend, but I was away uh, for my brother's wedding these past couple days. They didn't actually didn't get married on the weekend, they got married on Thursday, but so I was traveling past couple days celebrating my brother's wedding, which was super exciting. Um, hey everybody, hi and welcome. I'm trying to decide where to look at the chat. I think I'm going to look at it here okay that's another nice thing about this particular setup is i can actually sit here in front of my computer whereas when i did the streams the other way i had to have like the second old laptop that i was looking at the chat and whatever this is kind of a better setup so hello hello the piece in the back which piece well there's actually quite a few things behind me that I'm blocking. I got both my guitars over there and my Baroque cello is the one that's out. My modern cello is in the case right now. Because now that I have the two guitars also, I can't quite fit all the instruments. Two cellos, two guitars, all on that wall. It's just not big enough of a wall. Um, so they actually kind of rotate depending on what I'm using and what I'm practicing. But right now, um, the two guitars and the Baroque cello is what's out. Um, and if you meant piece like artwork, these are just photos I took when I was a teenager doing photography. And I actually left this wall. This wall could use it. I keep pointing the wrong way. This wall could use a piece of artwork for sure. Um, but I didn't put anything there because I used to film all my YouTube videos against the wall. And I liked a blank wall um, for filming against, especially if I was doing like any of those videos on my channel where there's multiple of me playing, I wanted just like a plain backdrop so there wouldn't be something confusing um, when I was like piecing together all the different video clips. Um, but as you guys know, if you're a subscriber to my channel, I don't film as many videos for my channel anymore. So it's not as important that this wall is blank. Um, so maybe I'll put something on there at some point. Hi everyone who's just joining, welcome to the Q&A stream. I have a couple questions that I'm gonna be taking from Instagram comments and a little question sticker that I put on my Instagram story. I should see if anyone asks questions on Facebook, but I just don't think anyone is going to. So I'll get into some of those and then I'll just take whatever questions you guys have and just talk and hang out, I try to do this once a month. Um, sometimes it's more focused on a specific topic, but I had some interesting questions, but nothing that I thought needed to be a whole live stream devoted to it. So it'll just be kind of like open questions about everything. Um, oh, peace in the back, meaning the sheet music. That makes more sense uh, than calling an instrument a piece. Yeah, so that book over there is the Gemignani cello sonatas. I'll get up, but then you guys will see that I'm wearing sweatpants. trying to keep it a little bit a uh, little bit of a secret that I had sweatpants on but now you know <laughs> so this looks like all my books dilapidated is that a word I just I don't know I love my books to death this doesn't even have the cover anymore but um this is a great edition of the Gemignani cello sonatas it's basically the handwritten facsimile edition um these performers facsimiles um printed by Browdy Brothers are the best I have their editions for the Vivaldi sonatas as well, and a bunch of different things. But so these are the Gemignani sonatas, and you can see it's this beautiful um, handwritten copy, but still pretty legible um, as far as handwritten copies go. And that's how all of these performers facsimiles are. They're really just awesome to play from. A great like gateway into getting used to playing from facsimiles. And if you don't know what a facsimile is, it's basically just these handwritten copies from the actual time period, as opposed to the modern print editions that we're kind of used to seeing in modern day. So I like to leave this on the stand open because it looks so nice, right? Because you asked about it. 
So put it back over here. Um, all right, okay, you guys are getting right into the question. So let's, let's get this stream going. Um, what cello methods would you recommend beginners to follow? So I actually use the Suzuki books for my beginner students, um, mostly just for the repertoire, because Suzuki, official Suzuki training on string instruments is a whole methodology with a specific approach where you actually play quite a bit on the instrument before you can read music. And I don't usually teach my students that way. Oftentimes my students are coming to me already playing in an orchestra program. And if you learn uh, first in an orchestra program at school, um, reading music happens really fast because you need it to be able to play an orchestra. So I don't follow the Suzuki method exactly, um, but I do use the books for repertoire. Um, they have a lot of good beginner pieces. So just like Suzuki cello book school, Suzuki cello school book one is like where you would start with the easy pieces. Um, so, and then I don't do a ton of like etudes and technical stuff. I make a lot of my own little exercises based on repertoire and I do a lot of scales. I think scales are really important. So a combination of scales and Suzuki pretty much. Um, any advice for staying motivated when learning the cello and it just sounds totally awful? Yeah, I, I totally know what you mean. I teach a lot of adult beginners um, or I have taught a lot of adult beginners over my teaching career. And so many people want to learn the cello because it's such a beautiful sounding instrument, right? But not everyone tells them that it doesn't sound beautiful for a while. It takes a long time to actually sound good on the cello or any string instrument. It just takes a long time to sound good. It's very different than piano and guitar where it just, you know, you don't even know what you're doing, but you can get an okay sound. Um, so I totally, totally understand the frustration. And it's something that I warn pretty much all my adult students about when they start studying. But Practice is the biggest and most important thing for improving yourself. Like if you've heard of the 10,000 hours to mastery, is it 10,000 hours? I didn't actually read that book, but the concept makes total sense. I know I've put 10,000 hours into pretty much anything I'm good at. Um, so basically you have to put the time in on the instrument to get better. And it can't be like phoned in in the beginning because technique is everything and technique exists for a reason. So the reason that we have a certain bow hold or a certain way that we play the left hand is for the best possible um, development of your technique, the way you're going to sound, the way you're going to be able to execute certain things. So spending disciplined practice time really focusing on technique is what's going to make the biggest difference. And it is frustrating in the beginning and it's slow in the beginning, but the more time you put in focusing on the right things, not just trying to force yourself to play the music. Um, and that's why I love scales because scales are a great way to just detach from the music for a second and really focus in on the technique and sounding good. Um, when I started playing Baroque cello, which is now pretty much what I've done professionally, I had been playing modern cello obviously for a while. I was already in college, but I did have to relearn a lot of technique and change a lot of technique to switch over to the Baroque cello. And I used to practice, I mean, I was in music school, so I was used to practicing, but I would practice 45 minutes of just technique before getting into my repertoire. So just scales, bow exercises, stuff like that, maybe practicing thirds and sixths, just 45 minutes of no music technique only. Um, and it was sort of like after I got through those 45 minutes, I could reward myself actually playing the repertoire I wanted to play, but it did wonders for my technique. It made such a difference to actually commit that amount of time to technique only. It's just string instruments are very technical, so you have to spend the time. Um, but, you know, make it a game. Think of it as an exercise. It's like going to the gym. Like, you just have to do it. And the, the way you can kind of get through it is make it as enjoyable as possible. Create a nice environment. Um, you know, have a routine set so it doesn't feel like you're wasting your time. You've got the time allotted for it. So that's what I would say is going to help you the most in sounding better. Um... Hi, Emily. I have a gamma recital coming up uh, this next academic year at Peabody. Nice. Any tips on preparing? I love Peabody. I actually played with a friend who was um, studying there for his master's in Baroque cello. I accompanied him in his master's recital. Is that what it was? Maybe it was a first year recital as a master's. Could have been his master's. I forget. It was quite a while ago. But we played in a really nice hall. Peabody is so nice. I visited it a couple times. Um, such a nice school. Um, so, okay, recital preparation. That's like going to take what I just said about everything to like the umpteenth degree because recitals are, of course, like the biggest, most important things that we do as classical musicians. 
I think for me, I was always big on scheduling and calendar, like having a goal of how many hours I wanted to do per day and how many days a week. Usually when it's recital prep, it's six out of seven days of the week. You should give yourself a day off if you can manage. But for me, I usually like a three hour a day goal just because any more than that, and you might just be practicing not very smart. Like I, I was all about efficient, smart practice. So like really working on technique and, um, you know, with essentially like warming up as much as possible because you can waste so much time when you jump right into practicing like the hard repertoire and you're not fully warmed up and you play it worse and then you get bad habits, like always allotting a big chunk of warm up and exercise time before getting into the repertoire. And then just like having goals each day, sort of knowing what you want to focus on, like for me, just like being organized and structured is really what helped the most because recitals are such a daunting task. There's so much music and it's usually hard music and there's pressure. So it's like just getting everything like either down to the list or bullet points or knowing how you want to spend your time helps take like the massive scariness and break it down into like manageable steps, which I think is the most important part of just like keeping the eyes on the prize and not getting overwhelmed by everything. So that would be preparation tips. And then I'm sure you've heard all the old sayings of like, you know, practice getting nervous. So perform for your friends and your family, make them listen to you recording yourself as disturbing as it is to listen to yourself. It's great to record yourself and watch it back because you can really see and learn things that you just can't see any other way. So when you get to that point, start just making little videos, even on your phone of yourself and, you know, see what's really going on. It's always good to have those reality checks too. And then listen to a lot of recordings of your pieces, you know, don't like rip off anyone's interpretation, but it's always good for staying inspired. What I like to do, I actually did this for my college auditions. When I was like tapped out on practicing and just couldn't focus anymore, I would listen to my repertoire and sort of imagine playing through it. And they say that actually does have benefits because like your neuropathways, like you're still using all the same brain activity. If you're playing it in your mind and hearing it, than if you were actually playing it. So there is a benefit to just listening to your repertoire and, and thinking about playing it too. So that's a good strategy when you're like exhausted. Um, have you ever had in mind to try the viola da gamba? What instruments are your favorite to play continual part in a Baroque cello sonata? Good question to you guys. I'm loving this already. Um, I have played viola da gamba. I love it. It's one of my favorite instruments. I actually reached a point once where I was like, maybe I shouldn't study it seriously because then it's not going to be the same. You know, like once you study an instrument seriously, it becomes like, you know, it's like a job or something. It becomes a little bit like, you don't not love it, but it, there's a stress involved doing it at a professional level. And I got to play gamba as more of like an amateur or a student or someone just learning. So it sort of stayed in that like magical happy place. Um, I first learned gamba at Oberlin Baroque Performance Institute, the summer festival at Oberlin, which I highly recommend. Um, it's really what got me into really doing Baroque music. And it's such a great festival. And Oberlin in the summertime is just magical. It's a great place. Um, so they have a beginner gamba class and I learned there, but then I didn't have access to a gamba for a while. And then when I was in grad school, I um, was able to borrow a gamba from my school. I played in some gamba classes like English Fantasia Suite, so playing some like real vile consort music, um, which was hard. It was a challenge, but it was fun. Um, and I could basically play continuo on the gamba, but real solo gamba repertoire I never really got to because most of it's an alto clef. And like my brain just hit capacity at three clefs, like bass, treble, and tenor. Like when you tried to add alto into the mix on an instrument like gamba, which is in the same range as the cello, but it has the strings are not tuned the same way. So you're constantly like mind jumbling. Any cellist gambist will tell you this in the beginning that it's very confusing because they're really close, but a little bit different. So it's really easy to be thrown off. So then when you add in the element of another clef, alto clef, I just couldn't do it. Didn't have the stamina and just focused on cello. So I play a little bit of gamba. I don't have an instrument now that I play on. If anyone wants to donate or lend me a gamba, I would make tons of gamba videos for the channel. I mean, they would not be advanced repertoire. Like I said, they would be like more beginnery pieces. So if anyone wants to sponsor me with a gamba or let me borrow one, we can make that happen. But until there is a gamba in my hands, unfortunately, won't be playing it for you guys. Oh, and so um, favorite instruments to play continuo in a Baroque cello sonata? 
Um, so for those who don't know, continuo, basso continuo is basically the accompaniment, the bass line to pretty much all Baroque repertoire. And it's generally represented by a sustained instrument like the cello, the gamba, the bassoon, something that can hold out long notes, a bass even, um, and a chordal instrument like a harpsichord, a lute, a theorbo, other plucked instruments, um, organ, so I actually think it really depends on the repertoire and the piece itself, which continuo team makes the most sense. Um, some of the Italian repertoire is really fun to have um, like a, a fiorbo or a guitar, something that can really cause a ruckus because the Italians really liked that excited energy. Um, for French repertoire, which there isn't a ton of for cello, it's mostly gamba, but anything French, I'm definitely going to want a harpsichord in there. Um, some of the more 17th century stuff like Frescobaldi, um, makes sense to use like a small portative organ. Um, so it really depends on the repertoire and, um, and the piece itself. My personal favorite is harpsichord. Um, harpsichord and maybe another cello just because the blend of two cellos can really, really be good. But I have to say as a cellist and someone who was mostly a continuo player, I always had a hard time when a cellist was accompanying me because I always like knew exactly how I wanted that continuo part played just being a cellist who plays continual myself. So it was very rare that I found someone who played continual in a way that like truly satisfied me because honestly, I wish I could just clone myself. When I started doing those double, um, you know, multiple part videos on my channel, I was like, this is ideal because then I can accompany myself just like I want to. Um, could you give me some advice to study the cello in a more conscious way? Um, it's kind of a vague question, so I'm not exactly sure what you're asking, and you can follow up if you'd like. I've kind of already made this point, but it's definitely part of my philosophy. Being aware of technique is just really um, makes a big difference, so like spending time on just technique. Um, because personally, I mean, for those who don't know my backstory, even though my backstory is plastered all over this YouTube channel, um, I really had a late start to the cello. You know, most people who end up as professionals start at four years old taking private lessons. I didn't take private lessons till I was nearly 15. So I was really behind and I had to do a lot of catching up with my technique. So I think that's why I preach the technique stuff so much is just because I really needed to spend that time getting my technique where it needed to be. But I learned a lot because I had to learn how to work on technique when I was a little bit more mature. You know, I was already in my late teens by then, as opposed to like a little kid taking lessons and just doing what their teacher says and their brain's more malleable and they're just learning things more easily. For me, I had to be conscious about it because I was older. Um, so spending time just on technique away from repertoire is, has just been really valuable because I'm a very musical person and if I'm playing music, like then my whole brain is on the music and the creativity, the artistic expression, and I can kind of not put the focus on technique. So separating technique away from repertoire was really useful for me. Um, what music school did I go to? So I did my undergrad um, at the Hart School, which is at the University of Hartford in Connecticut. And the Hart School is their music school. So that's where I did my bachelor's degree, which is cello performance as my official bachelor's. Um, for my first three years, I was studying modern, regular cello. But for my senior year, I got special permission to take full-time Baroque cello lessons and do a Baroque cello recital. So by the time I graduated, I was like fully in my historical performance world, uh, even though my degree is just general cello performance. And I still had to complete all those regular cello courses. Um, and then my master's degree I got at the Longy School, um, which is now owned by Bard College. Longy itself is in Cambridge, Massachusetts, right next to Harvard. Um, but the Bard, Bard College that owns it is in upstate New York. But yeah, so I got my master's from Longy, and that is a master's of early music. So that degree was all focused on the historical performance stuff. Um... You guys are awesome. I'm glad we have so many questions today. Um, any advice to keep motivated with music? Again, kind of a broad question, but um, you know, motivation, especially if you're doing this on a professional track, you're trying to be a professional, you are a professional, your motivation is gonna go in and out, like with anything, with any job. Um, so, you know, I think accepting the low times of when you're feeling a little bit less motivated 
not letting that beat up your ego and your emotions so much because that actually then feeds the negative cycle and it's even harder to get yourself motivated. So if you feel a little unmotivated, remind yourself that that's normal and that's okay. And maybe you're burning yourself out. Maybe you're overworking yourself. Um, but also I think it's good to have like kind of, um, I don't like super concrete goals because I think Honestly, like we're not as in charge of life as we think we are and it's nice to have concrete goals But I think it's better to have more like bigger picture ideas of what you want at least for my music career That's always how I was so keeping those big picture ideas in mind Whether it's like you want to be playing chamber music concerts professionally or you want to have a big teaching studio and be able to put on a recital of all your students or um, you want to play a concerto with an orchestra at some point, whatever your goals are, you know, keep those in mind to inspire you and keep you moving uh, when the times feel a little low. Um, have those big picture goals in mind, but just know that getting unmotivated, it happens. And there are a lot of videos. If you guys are interested in like more general music motivation, music career stuff, I do have a lot of videos on my channel where I go in detail about this stuff. Um, they're either going to be in the instructional videos playlist, though those are a little bit more teachery with like music history stuff. They might be in the vlogs or possibly in the live streams too, but I talk on a lot of these topics um, so you can get a little more, some more ideas. Like I think there's something about like how to, I definitely did like a how to stay inspired video at some point. So just look through my channel for that because that will have even more pointers. Um... Have you ever had the feeling that playing was more a job than a passion? Uh, when you're doing a gig that you don't like, it definitely feels that way. And that's just a part of life. Like as a professional musician, you're going to have to play gigs or do concerts or teach lessons that you don't really want to do. I mean, that's just a part of every job. Um, I personally have always loved music and have never, ever questioned that. Um, like I, I've always known that music... Or I don't know if about always known, because honestly, when I was in my preteens and teens, I always loved music. I was always doing music, but I was super creative in all sorts of ways. Like my pictures, I always point the wrong way. Like I was doing photography pretty seriously. I was writing poetry pretty seriously. Like I have always been creatively expressing myself. And it wasn't really until I started taking cello lessons that I decided cello was the route that I was going to go creatively. Um, so I don't want to say I always knew I was going to be a professional musician, but... Um, since deciding to be, that never wavered. But there, yeah, there are times where you're gonna do things that are not that fun. You're gonna teach a student who never practices, who doesn't care. You're gonna play a gig with a bunch of really bad musicians playing music that you hate with a bad conductor. Like that stuff just happens and we all gotta make money. Um, so we have to do those sometimes. But I think it's so long as you're keeping things in your musical sphere that are rewarding, that you do like to do, that helps it not feel like you're just in a grind. And I think a lot of people forget that and they just do whatever's going to give them a paycheck and then suddenly they have nothing rewarding going on. And it's just the reality that most of the more rewarding things are not going to pay as well. Sorry to break the news. But like, for example, when I was back in Boston, I found that a string quartet and that was one of the most rewarding things I've done in my career. But we were not making money from the beginning. You don't just become a string quartet and start making money. Like you've got to promote yourself. You have to play concerts. You have to get out there. Um, there's just a lot of stuff you have to do to make money off of your music, but we invested the time and we so enjoyed playing the music and studying the music and putting on the concerts. Our first concert was out of pocket. We rented the venue. We did charge, or I think we had suggested donation, um, for tickets. We did make a little bit of money actually, but, um, you know, we had to upfront some money and we of course put tons of time into the rehearsals. So it's worth doing those things that don't pay you back right away if they are artistically and creatively fulfilling because that's what will make you feel like you actually have a career you like. Um, it can't all come down to the dollars, unfortunately. And then if it does well enough, you will eventually make money from it if you're smart about it and you're business savvy, which again, I have a lot of pointers on my channel about and I think there's not enough education about that in classical music, how to actually turn your career into like a business that makes you some money. Um, but that is absolutely possible, even though we don't learn those skills as much as we should. Um, how do you determine fingerings when none are suggested? When teaching, do you use Roman numerals to suggest, to suggest fingering to maintain sonority of string tone? Okay, um, so historical fingerings, like the fingerings that I would do on my Baroque cello, are different than modern cello fingerings, which is the way most people would play cello. So I'll kind of answer a little bit to both. Um, 
So a lot of times for fingerings, it really depends on the passage, you know, what makes sense. There's a couple good rules about fingerings that I've learned that I generally follow. And then there are also historical rules about fingerings, what they did in the 17th and 18th century uh, centuries for fingerings. But um, one useful rule is like not shifting at the, if there's a group of four 16th notes, not shifting on the last of four. Um, little things like that that will create additional hiccups, shifting in unmusical places. In general, we want to shift somewhere that kind of goes along with the music so that that natural little space that we're going to get from changing positions falls somewhere musically and doesn't actually create a break in the music. Um, and then actually, there's historical sources that say you're not supposed to ever shift under a slur at all, um, which is not even always possible, but it's a good thing to kind of shoot for. Um, and then, of course, for historical fingerings, we played much more in first position. So more string crossings and more first position for historical fingerings. And then for modern, you know, fingerings, we, of course, want to avoid at string crossings. So we tend to do things up in position more. So based on if I'm being historical or not, that also affects my fingerings. Um, I am not a huge proponent of like traveling really far up one string. Again, that's more of like a modern convention and I veer towards the older, more historical approach. Doesn't mean I won't shift to alternate positions on a modern steel string instrument, but um, I would say I don't like to do, I find those fingerings fussy, to be honest, like going really high up on the, you know, C string or something. It's not really my style, but really depends on the repertoire. I like it to do it in Brahms, Brahms E minor sonata. It's kind of fun to go up the C string when you start that one. Just depends. Um, oh, thank you for your comment, Kevin. You've been supportive of me for so long. I really appreciate it. Um, how do you improve your sound quality? So sound quality mostly comes down to bow, right? Because that's what's drawing the sound. The bow is our voice. Speaking of voice, I could use a drink of water. So, um, bow technique, and especially for Baroque cello, we spend a lot of time on bow technique because we don't use left-hand vibrato as much on Baroque cello. On modern cello, you know, we do a lot with sound from just vibrato alone. But the bow is really what's drawing the sound. So I love doing, like, picking a different bowing and then doing it on scale. So whether it's like a slurred bowing or, you know, something with repeated notes, like I'll do different bowings on scales, really listening for just how I'm uh, drawing the sound out on the bow. Even practicing open strings is really useful. So we tend to, in modern cello playing, neglect the right hand and just think, okay, if we're playing, we're good, and then make everything about tuning and vibrato in the left hand. But there's a lot to be said about the bow hand, um, and I think modern players especially do not practice it as much. Um, so, okay, I think I banged through all those questions pretty fast. If you've just uh, recently joined, welcome to the monthly Q&A, sort of monthly, because I always do some kind of live stream once a month here on YouTube. Um, and I usually post about it 24 hours ahead of time if I can, maybe 12 hours ahead of time if I can. Um, and I take the questions usually on Instagram, either my Instagram story or on an Instagram post. So I do have a couple questions I'm gonna grab from my phone in a second. Um, but of course I take them live in the chat too. Um, does the US have standardized music exams like ABRSM or Trinity in the UK? If not, uh, how do music teachers in the US measure progress? So um, I am actually not familiar with those UK things that you have, but um, we have kind of, I guess what's most common in the States is um, statewide competitions. So I grew up in New York, so mine was called NISMA, N-Y-S-S-M-A, um, and that was like, was it NISMA? Now I'm forgetting, and there was like all state and all these things, but they're basically like auditions within your state. Um, there are different levels, usually one through six, and there are specific repertoire choices within each level. And then you go to some like school building on some day and all the kids from the various schools in that region go and do the little audition. You get an evaluation sheet based on how you do. You get placed into regional orchestras, so like ones for the county or sometimes ones for the whole state. Um, all state, which it would be like all the people who um, got the highest grades in the top level get invited to the top state um, groups, which was orchestra for me, but of course there's bands for band instruments. I did get to go to Allstate my senior year, which was really fun. 
got to go to Eastman in Rochester, New York. And if you guys have never been to Eastman, it's such a beautiful school with an amazing hall. Freezing cold there, but um, it was a really cool place to go as a teen and get to rehearse. Um, so that's kind of what we have, like statewide evaluations, basically. Um, I'm playing a really fast section in Tchaikovsky's Sixth Symphony First Movement. How do you effectively bring up the tempo in the passage? So anytime you want to increase the tempo of something, there's kind of like levels. So yes, you want to practice it slow first um, and as slow as it needs to be. Not like, oh, I'm slowing it down a little. Like if it's a really complicated passage, as slow as it needs to be to be 100% accurate. So be honest with yourself about how slow you need to do it first. But um, be careful about articulation because one thing that can happen is when we slow things down, we really change the articulation. So like we'll probably start playing longer and more smooth, which is okay if you really, you know, you're trying to listen for the notes. But as you increase the tempo a little bit at a time, remember gradual, do not just jump to the end tempo, have to increase gradually. Um, be sure that you're adjusting your articulation accordingly because um, likely if it's a fast passage, you're not gonna be playing really legato smooth notes. They're gonna be faster and you know, probably maybe off the string or whatever it is. So actually be applying that same articulation even though you're going at a slower tempo is a good way to work on it also. Um, but just working it up a little bit at a time with the metronome right there. Um, drones are useful too. If intonation is particularly challenging in the passage, drones are always great for intonation. I love um, playing scales with drones too. It's just great. And I have, I always talk about this every stream, but I have this little, my tuning metronome box here um, that I really like. I've had it forever. And I do have a link to this on my Amazon shop, which is in the description of the video. It has just like all my basic supplies, like which steel strings I use on my modern cello, my favorite rosin for Baroque and modern, um, and this guy. So this is basically a metronome, but what's cool about it, for one, it has, um, you can change the tuning by the scent. So like, I'm at 415 now, and a 415A, but if I wanted to go up to 440, I could, or if you're one of those people who tunes to 442, because the New York Phil, then you can put it on 442. So you can tune it by the scent, but then you can also go through the notes. And there's a volume. And then it's a metronome too. A pretty handy metronome. So I really like this box because I can tune, I can do scales to drones with it. I can do either tuning 415 or 440. I can use it as a metronome. So this thing is like super handy. I've had it for like a thousand years. It hasn't broken or anything like that. Um, so that's my little sales pitch on that. Um, can you talk a little bit about perfectionism? How much of it is enough? Because sometimes I feel that it's starting to disturb me. Yeah, so this is a big topic and I could honestly talk about it forever. It's such a fine line because, you know, classical music is very demanding and very detail oriented and very technical. So we do need a certain amount of perfectionism just to accomplish what we're trying to accomplish, right? Like we can't really just like feel it, man. <laughs> like it's not that kind of music. It, it requires a lot of discipline. So um, we need a little bit of that perfectionism to keep us going. Um, where I think it gets dangerous is when we start to be looking at things kind of outside of ourselves. Like I saw some really great quote that, I don't know, I'm gonna butcher it, but something about like, the only thing that you should be comparing yourself to is yourself yesterday. Like the only thing that you're measuring up against is just you. You know, there's no comparison against other people. And that's where perfectionism I think gets the most toxic and especially in music school is when we start comparing to other people and feeling inadequate and feeling like we'll never be good enough, then it gets bad. But if we're only looking at ourselves and what can we improve and how can we get better, how can we make our own skills better than they were yesterday? Then I think it stays in a healthy place because then it's just about self growth, which we can always do. And I think every performer, every musician is always trying to get better every day. I mean, I've certainly had times in my life where I maybe like wasn't putting in as much effort as other times, but that doesn't mean I believe that some of the work I had paid my dues in the past and that work was continuing to blossom as things got easier for me. But I think that you have to be a little strict on yourself to get better. But 
I think if you find that you lean in that direction and you tend to be self-critical and you tend to be perfectionistic, then you probably need reminders in the other direction. You don't need more perfectionism. Like you need reminders to like take a break, chill, it's okay. Like celebrate small victories, be proud of like, you know, progress that you are making. If you're making any progress, be glad that there is progress. So, you know, I think it's hard because I, I know that we need a little bit of that perfectionism to keep us going and to keep us motivated and driven. That's important. Um, but yeah, I would say the biggest thing is trying to keep a lid on or be aware of comparisons to other people and other things because that's where it becomes, you know, we can never be another person musically, technically, on any level. We cannot be anyone but ourselves. So that's, I think, the most destructive thoughts we can have. So watch out for those. Keep just working on making yourself the best player, the best musician that you can be. Um, and that's what I would say about that. Hopefully that helps. Okay. Um, let's maybe go to some, um, some Instagram questions. Spilled some water there. Okay. Okay. So someone asks, I would love to hear more about your practice routine and important techniques to practice daily. So I kind of already talked about this stuff, but I'm going to reiterate it a little bit. Um, so full disclaimer, I am not practicing daily on cello anymore uh, at the moment because uh, for those who are like avid followers of my channel know that I have shifted my focus a little bit just in the past six months um, more towards my other musical project which is pop songwriting so i'm doing a lot more of that now i of course still have cello stuff going on i have students that i teach um i released an album last year with my violinist friend i'm still putting content on the youtube channel all the time so i'm still doing cello stuff um, but i'm not doing it as actively as i was before because i have another musical project that is taking up a lot of my like full-time music hours only so many hours in the day guys and I also practice cello like really hard for like 10 years straight. So I'm a little bit due for a break, but um, I'm gonna talk about what my practice routine was like when I was practicing regularly, when I, it was either con concerts with my quartet, um, solo recitals, album releases, like I had lots of things that I needed to practice for. Um, so the biggest thing I've always said, scales and warm ups first. 30 minutes if you can, like really spending that time warming up. It makes practicing so much better because you're actually like your hands and everything is on deck. Cause you know, we all have this with an instrument. I don't know why it is. Sometimes you sit down to play and it's like, this feels great. I feel just awesome. This sounds so good. Sometimes we sit down to play and it's like, do I even play this instrument? Like what is going on today? I sound horrible. I'm out of tune on every single note. Like you just never know how you're going to arrive at your instrument on any given day. So that's why warm-ups are so important is no matter where you are, they level the playing field and get you on deck with whatever you need. So um, doing a good chunk of warm-ups and scales um, before getting into repertoire is like the biggest thing for practice routine. And then deciding a minimum for how much you want to meet that day and then being realistic about it. Like maybe it's only an hour, um, but then feeling like you meet that goal and then you can decide if you want to practice more rather than setting unattainable goals. Like I want to practice two or three hours today and then you're tired and you don't have the time or you put in 90 minutes, but then you don't make it to two hours. So then you feel like a failure when in reality you still practice 90 minutes. Like that's not bad. So kind of setting realistic goals, scheduling. I'm just really big on scheduling because especially for musicians, a lot of us, we do not have like a regular schedule. So creating that for yourself and creating that structure is what helps you kind of stay on top of all your tasks. Um, so that's what I'd say about that. Let's see what else we got here. Talk about your inspirations. What gets you out of bed in the morning? What's rattling around in your creative brain? I like that question. So, um, I, uh, used to, when I was doing like way more cello projects and stuff, like 
I would listen. I actually had, iTunes used to have this. I wonder if they still do. They had like a Baroque radio station that played a lot of period instrument recordings. And I would just have that on like all the time. And I was constantly discovering like new repertoire, new pieces, new groups, all under the Baroque music umbrella, which I really loved. Like, I think listening is really important. Just like, you know, listening to recordings that inspire you, um, you know, when you're in music school, you get exposed to a lot, but once you're out of school, especially, it's great to keep listening to stuff. And I personally didn't like to listen to a lot of actual cello repertoire because it felt too close to home. Like it was hard to listen to like the Bach cello suites or whatever, and not be thinking about my own performances or my own practice or my own knowledge of the piece. So I like to listen to things that are just a little bit outside of cello. Like I listen to a ton of gamba music because I love French Baroque. I love the gamba. So I used to listen to gamba music like crazy. And that was really inspiring for me because it was totally under the same umbrella musically, but it wasn't pieces that I had specific like technical associations with. Um, so I think staying inspired, listening to things that inspire you. For some people that might be going to concerts, I did go to some really, probably the best concerts I've been to uh, were Jordi Saval, um, who I'm sure you guys know, but if you don't, Google him. He's the man. And his various groups and orchestras, you know, he, he used to run an orchestra and now he has like a gamba group. I've been to some of his concerts that were really inspiring. Um, so for some people it's going to concerts, for some people it's just listening to recordings on their own. But just something that keeps you in touch with that love that you have for the music is so important. Um, so that it doesn't become such a crazy grind all the time. Let's see. All right, and then we had some from the question sticker. We'll go to that. Okay. Okay, are you gonna go back to posting yourself playing on your channel? So I obviously posted a lot of videos of myself playing when I launched this channel. That's still the bulk of the content on this channel is videos of me playing. But after about like two solid years of like, I was doing a video a week of me playing, like it was a lot. There's so much music up there now. Like I covered so much repertoire. I put in so much work recording those videos. Not all of them are great, <laughs> but you know, I was doing it on a regular basis. So I was just like trying to get them out there and keep the content moving. Um, so it's hard now because there's not as much repertoire left. Like I could re-record things that I did before, but just being honest, because I'm not practicing as much as I used to, because I've now have my other music project, it's a lot harder to record myself because there is a certain amount of like real preparation involved. And if I'm being totally honest, I don't have to do much preparation for these Q and A streams. I set up the stream and then I just talk to you guys and I'm able to give you content right away, um, you know, without having to spend additional time. And my time's super valuable now with all the things that I'm juggling. So videos of myself playing, it's a lot, you know, besides the preparation and choosing the repertoire, filming yourself without an assistant there is a lot of work, getting a good take, you know, and then you put all this work into the video. And for me, I'm a girl, so I do hair and makeup and all this stuff and pick out what I'm gonna wear and make the video. And then someone comments and they go, eh, it sounds terrible. It's just like, you put in a lot to sometimes get that. So it's not really the best use of my time anymore to record myself playing, but that doesn't mean I'm never going to do it again. When the moment is right, or I have the time, or there's a piece, I'll absolutely do it. It just hasn't been the most efficient for the channel. And that's also why I've been featuring lots of other musicians, because one, I've created this huge platform for early music, specifically Baroque music. And I would love to extend this great audience that I have here um, out to more of these musicians who are helping keep this music alive and who are playing this music. So if you missed it, my last video that I put up was a guy playing the hurdy-gurdy, which is a super cool, interesting instrument um, that is uh, from the Baroque period, but dates way before that as well. Um, so that's the kind of stuff I really like putting on the channel now is featuring other people, exposing them to an audience, exposing the audience to them. And if you do play earlier classical music and you want to be on my channel, I have a form on my website that you can fill out to apply. So you can go to emilyplacecello.com slash collaborators, or if you just go to emilyplacecello.com, you can click on collaborators and apply, um, to have your video featured on my channel. Cause I'm doing a lot more of that now which to me is a great way to give back to, to the community. So I'm really happy about that. I know people want to see more videos of me playing, but there's a lot of videos of me playing on my channel. Like you could probably spend like your whole 
evening and beyond just watching me play the cello if you wanted to. Um, and then there's live streams of me playing too. So I feel like there's enough of me playing cello if I'm being quite honest. Um, so that's that. Um, how to soundproof your apartment. So that's very complicated um, depending on where you live and the situation. And I actually don't really have any official soundproofing. It's always complicated as a musician living in an apartment building and I've dealt with a lot of different situations. Um, the best thing is ideally if you can get like a first floor apartment then you know there's no one below you, um, which helps a lot because most of what you hear neighbor wise, sound wise tends to be the person above you. Um, but at the very least carpeting all your floors or putting rugs on your floors is really important. You can get actual sound panels that go on your wall. I've considered doing them for this wall. Um, so like, but some apartment buildings actually have regulations about soundproofing materials because they're very flammable. So it can be dangerous. Um, but in general, having a rug on your floor is really important. The more stuff in the room, the more natural soundproofing you have. So while it sounds great to play in a big empty room because there's all that reverb, that's really bad for neighbors and stuff. So having a room that has carpet, curtains, furniture, that's kind of creating natural soundproofing. Um, but then a good thing is to just like know your neighbors and, and tell them I'm a musician and I'm, I need to practice sometimes and... You know, here's how you can contact me if there's ever an issue. And then, you know, don't play at night and don't uh, don't play in the mornings. Yeah, if you play between 8 and 11 p.m. It depends on your neighbors. You know, some people don't care or they're not home and they don't hear you and it's no problem. Some people are really anal and care a lot. Like, it just really depends on your situation. So it's good to know your neighbors and have an open discussion about it if you can. Um, and then do your best to soundproof. But, like... Apartment buildings are tough. People have horror stories of like not being able to practice at all because they have terrible neighbors who won't allow it and want to make a big fuss about noise ordinances. And it can get complicated. Like I was um, seeing students in my apartment and I had a guy living below me. This was back in Boston who really flipped out at me because he hated listening to my bad student. I mean, you know, like my beginner students not sounding so fantastic would drive him crazy. Um, so you really do have to kind of know your apartment building, know your neighbors, do your best to soundproof, but it just depends. If you can create like a small space that's like, you know, you people can put like mattress pads and you can soundproof with like basically anything soft and cushy. Like I said, rugs, curtains, whatever. Um, how to buy a cello if you're a beginner. So I generally recommend that people do not purchase a cello when they're starting out just because they are so expensive. And if you're getting a bargain cello, it's just not, and I'm not even being snobby. If you're getting a full size cello, which any adult would play a full size, if you're getting a full size cello for less than 800 to a thousand dollars, it's going to be a bad instrument, unfortunately, just a cheap, not very good instrument, unless you just like found some amazing deal. But in general, a good halfway decent student full-size cello is about a thousand dollars so I don't really recommend that people buy them it's quite easy to rent string instruments that's what most people do and many rental places actually allow you to build up equity so that when you're making your rental payments some of that money is actually going towards eventually purchasing the instrument so that's rentals are what I recommend there are a lot of instrument shops that rent instruments um, you just have to look in your area and there are even some websites like I think Shar music so that's s-h-a-r music.com and also johnsonstring.com i think they do online rentals too so there's a lot of options for renting all right i feel like i'm answering these questions at 100 miles an hour but i was only going to stream for about an hour so it's probably good so we are going to wrap up fairly soon so if you have lingering questions definitely throw them in Let's see if there's anything else. Some people just asked for me to play, which I'm clearly not playing on the stream today, just doing questions. Um, are you satisfied with your cello career so far? So yeah, I my cello career has been really awesome and unexpected and great. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so for those who don't know, I graduated um, from grad school in 2012, so that was when I finished my master's. So what was that? Seven years ago now that I've been out of school. 
though I was already freelancing a bit, like most people when they're in grad school, they're teaching some private lessons and playing some professional concerts. So I, w- I was working in grad school as well, but not full time. Um, I have a big closet. Should I try there first? Yes, definitely try the closet first. So that's your best option probably uh, for soundproofing. Um, so back on my life. So yeah, so starting in 2012 is when I actually like when I wasn't in school anymore and I could do full-time music. And the first thing I did was record my first solo album, Bass Sounds, which I just self-released, self-produced. My brother mixed and mastered it for me. That album is still up on Spotify, iTunes, everywhere. Um, And then to go along with Bass Sounds, I did a release concert for it. So that was really great. Um, so right away after school, I was able to do a solo recital and that was just self-made stuff, which people forget that like as a musician, so much of your career is just in your own hands and you have to create your own projects and create your own opportunities. And luckily I'm someone who does that. So I was able to do a lot of really cool, interesting stuff, but it's not stuff that was handed to me. It's all stuff that I decided to do myself. So the solo album was a big one, bass sounds. And then two, three years later, I did bass sounds evolved, which had three release concerts that I did along with it. Um, and then I founded my string quartet, Emergence Quartet. We were together for three years, did so many concerts, got to play a lot of places, fly all over the country, do a lot of really cool stuff. Um, and having a professional string quartet was definitely like on my bucket list. That was one of my big goals. Um, I wanted to do solo concerts also, but um, chamber music was really what I wanted. So I would say like the string quartet really fulfilled a lot of my dreams when I was able to do that. But the solo albums and the solo recitals were also amazing. Like just to be able to know that I was able to put on a concert professionally and have people come out and pay money and attend it and buy the albums and actually like it. It was so gratifying for me after music school was so hard. And so, you know, I was always like the worst one, which there's videos on that too on my channel. Um, My underdog video is I think one of the most popular videos on my channel, but, um, So being able to sort of prove to myself that I could do things professionally and people actually cared was really amazing. So, and then I had a huge private studio back in Boston. I had 18 private students at once, um, all ages from elementary school through adults and everything in between. I got to um, fly out to the University of Central Oklahoma and be a visiting artist there in 2013, um, where I did recitals, lectures, master classes. Um, So I've done like, I did like everything that I wanted to do, like, and lectures in schools. I did like lots of historical performance demos, um, chamber music, solo. Uh, I got to play with Handel and Haydn Society in Boston, one of the best Baroque orchestras in the country. I got to do one concert set with them. So like, I got to do like kind of everything that I wanted to do, which is I think partially why, um, you know, my focus has changed a little bit because I accomplished so many of the things I set out to do almost faster than I thought I would, especially given my late start. So I'm very pleased with my cello career. And for me, you know, I'm always kind of on to the next thing, you know, like, and I could have done more cello stuff, but I moved to LA and that sort of presented different opportunities to me. And since has been my, you know, my shifting in my career a bit, but I'm so grateful for all the things I got to do on cello and continue to do even just stuff like this, doing the Q and A's, talking to you guys, being able to give back to the community, help give exposure to other musicians. Like all of that is super rewarding for me. Favorite music YouTubers, you know, um, especially in terms of classical music, there aren't enough in my opinion. You know, a lot of the bigger YouTubers um, who play classical instruments are doing more modern stuff like the cello guys. Um, and stuff like that cover you know doing covers of stuff which is all fine nothing against it but I wish there were more channels like mine to be honest that just like purely classical music focused channels that have educational and performance content the problem is that most classical musicians don't want to put out lots of content of them playing because of the perfectionism curse which is too bad because there are so many great players out there who would crush it you know if they wanted to put lots of videos of them out there for the world to consume but people are too critical and they're not doing themselves a service in my opinion but so I you know two set violin they're pretty funny um but there's if there's some really great youtube channels I need to know about um especially classical music focus definitely let me know um oh authentic sound thank you for mentioning him he's a friend of mine I mean an internet friend he's great he is a great example and that's someone that I should have mentioned 
For those who don't know Authentic Sound, he is a historical keyboard player. So he plays like harpsichord, forte, piano, organ, um, all the historical keyboard instruments. And he's super knowledgeable, really good player. He does a lot of really great high quality live streams of him practicing. Um, we did like a dual interview a while back on both of our channels, but um, I really appreciate what he's doing and think he's great. So that's a good example. Um, all right. Let's see. Well, we're already pretty much at closing time. So uh, I don't know, Eduardo. I'm going to check out all these people, though, for sure. Um, so I appreciate all of the suggestions of other YouTubers and let the chat, you know, know about some, too. Um, okay, let's see if we got anything else question-wise, and then we'll wrap up. This was fun. Time flies. It looks like I'm looking at nothing. I have my phone here. I realized that it was not in the shot. Oh, well, Luis, thank you for your kind words. I'm glad I could provide some uplifting. We need more uplifting energy in the classical music world. It's a little too harsh. Um, do you believe in playing secondary instruments? If so, which ones? I mean, yeah, totally. It's a little complicated depending where you are on your music journey. You know, like if you're, say, behind, like you're trying to really get on a professional track with an instrument and you're not quite there yet, you could like dilute your time by trying to play another instrument too. Like you do really want to have a top priority if you're trying to be like a primary instrumentalist on one instrument. You do want to have that at the top of the priority list. But in general, playing other instruments only enriches your musicianship. I mean, I had to take piano uh, for music school, I think four semesters, so two years of piano, and I was so bad. I was so bad and it was so hard, but we were all so bad because we all played other instruments. <laughs> um, yeah, and I did not retain a lot of that piano knowledge, unfortunately. I just, like, it was hard. I was trying to practice cello so much. I was so busy with other stuff. So learning piano was like, but I, I actually really did enjoy parts of it. And as I mentioned, and as you guys can see, I do play guitar, acoustic and electric. I mean, mostly acoustic, but I can play electric too. I play rhythm guitar, not really lead guitar. I could learn lead guitar probably pretty easily since I play the cello, but I just never, I'm self-taught on the guitar, so I've never had like a guitar lesson of any kind really. And I played guitar before I played cello. I actually started playing guitar when I was six years old, um, self-taught. My dad got me a guitar and showed me how to read little chord charts um, and then gave me a book of Beatles songs with the chord charts and sent me on my way. And that's how I learned guitar. So I actually have been doing that. Oh, Daisy, she always comes right at the end of the stream. Come here, everyone wants to see you. They've been wondering where you are. Let me get her. Don't eat that. She looks a little sleepy, which will be good for looking good on camera. All right, Daisy. So, um, so yeah, I actually played guitar when I was really little, way before I played cello. And now I'm actually playing a ton of guitar for my songwriting. And it was amazing how much it came back. Right? I, didn't, I didn't play guitar for years. And then I started playing it again, and, it, and you know, the first day was a little rough, but by a week in of playing again, it was like it all came back. It was really amazing. Like, times of practicing for hours when I was 12, and suddenly all that muscle memory was still there. It was like, I guess like they say, like riding a bike. Right, Daisy? The only reason she's not squirming to get away is because she's tired. Yeah. But everyone needs to see your beautiful face. I know this is why you guys came for the live stream. Yeah. Um, I want a Baroque guitar and lute. They're so expensive. Yeah, historical instruments. They're hard to find makers, and then they're expensive, and then the maintenance is expensive, and the strings are expensive. So, yeah, not a cheap hobby at all. And then the irony is that it's so expensive to play, all, honestly, all classical instruments, and then we don't even make any money doing it, so we can't even afford to do what we're doing. It's a sad conundrum. Yeah, my acoustic guitar is a nylon string, and I learned on a nylon string, so I actually always play nylon string for my acoustic, and I love it. It's funny, because my dad got the nylon string because I was so little, I was six, 
and he just thought my little fingers would do better on a nylon string, but now I've just taken a real liking to it. Wow, Daisy, this is the longest you've ever just stayed like this, so I'm not putting her down until she asks for it. You guys got to just keep asking me questions because I'm stuck here. Who wants to ask Daisy a question? <laughs> Anything else, guys? I can't even look at my phone. All right, you ready to go? Thank you for this cuddle session. All right. Okay, guys, I think that might be it. So this was fun. Thank you so much for coming by the Q&A. Um, as you guys know, I always have the little donation page if you want to give a donation for the stream, but it's, of course, not at all necessary. It's just if you want to say thanks. Um, but thank you guys for coming by. Um, if you joined late, the stream is going to be up, archived on YouTube. I don't know. It usually takes like an hour or two. But then the whole live stream will be up. Um, so you will be able to watch it afterwards and see what you missed. Oh, another question. If not guitar, cello, what instrument? Harpsichord. And when I have money, I'm buying one. Um, even though I just made that whole thing about how I can't play piano. Though I like playing the harpsichord better than playing the piano. But I just love the harpsichord. It's just an amazing instrument and, um, beautiful. And yeah, I, I, I'm definitely, mark my words when I've upgraded my living situation and my financial situation and I've got some money to blow and I've got the space for it, getting a harpsichord. Um, and I don't have any Baroque method books on theory. Um, theory, that's interesting because a lot of the method books that I um, learned, like where we call them treatises from the Baroque, are more like technique books about um, actual playing technique and musical things like ornamentation. Um, but music theory, I think most of the music theory um, treatises from the Baroque are keyboard oriented because it was the keyboard players who needed to know the most theory because they were the continual players and they were filling out the harmony. So probably the most music theory you can learn in the Baroque era is learning figured bass, which is basically when you see a note in the bass line, it says like six, four, five, three, four, two has numbers over it, understanding what those numbers mean and how to interpret them. That's like the main music theory of the Baroque is figured bass, um, which there are definitely um, books on, but I'm not a keyboard player, so I don't know them off the top of my head. Um, okay. All right. Now I'm really wrapping up. Thanks again, guys. And yeah, like I said, there's so many videos on my channel. So if you're somewhat new here, definitely go explore in the vlogs and ex instructional playlist. That's going to answer a lot of like lingering questions or just like go into more detail about stuff. So definitely check those out. Or if you're one of those people that wishes I was still playing cello on my channel, go watch some of my old videos of me playing cello. There's lots of those too. Um, and thank you guys so much for coming by. You know, I always do these like once a month if I can. So, um, if you're subscribed to my channel and you hit the bell next to the subscribe button, it'll actually email you when I go live. So, you know, um, or just follow me on Instagram, Facebook, whatever. I'm Emily plays cello everywhere. Uh, oh, and then I have my Patreon still, um, which is basically what supports me continuing to make these YouTube videos. Um, there should be a link to my Patreon in the description of the video, but it's P A T R E on.com slash Emily plays cello. And those are basically like recurring donations for every time I post on my channel, which is right now about two times a month, sometimes three times a month. So people pledge like a dollar, two dollars, three dollars. And then, um, I get that every time I post a video on my channel, like twice a month. Um, so that's been a great support to my YouTube channel too. I have some patrons who have been supporting the channel for years. It's really what allows me to keep it going all the time. And there are rewards too. Like you can get a free copy of my digital albums, like stuff like that if you pledge. So definitely check out my Patreon too if you like the channel. All right, guys. Enjoy the rest of your Tuesday. If it's Tuesday where you are, thanks again for watching. And I'll see you next time.